Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Replay. We are playing uh, Deus Ex this week. Uh, we've got Ben Hansen. Hello, everybody. Adam Beesner On the keyboard. And we've got two special guests. We've got uh, Raul Ramirez, who's a producer on Epic Mickey 2. Hey, everybody. And uh, we have super extra special guest, Warren Spector, who is the vice president, uh, general manager of Junction Point Studios, but he's also the creative director on Epic Mickey 2. Just just general mastermind of Epic Mickey 2. <laughs> 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 And we're going to play some Deus Ex. Did you do anything with this game, Warren? I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> cool. So we can go and kind of go in fresh. Now, this, this is a, like a trip down memory lane for me. Holy cow. Um, yeah, right when the logo popped up, you, you started laughing and getting excited. Well, you know, I don't think I've played this game since 2004, oh maybe 2003. So uh, this is uh, really a blast from the past. Although it's funny, that's not true. I was uh, in Australia recently in a museum. The Australian Center for the Moving Image did, did an exhibit called uh, Game Masters. And uh, I am one of the Game Masters. And um, <laughs> they, had, they had Underworld Oops. 1, System Shock, and Deus Ex, and Disney Epic Mickey all running. And I tried playing Underworld, and it was like, oh my god, what was I thinking? <laughs> and then System Shock, it's like, are you kidding? We thought it was a good idea to use every key on the keyboard? <laughs> <laughs> and Deus Ex, I, I went, boy, at least it's playable. So, uh, that was a good thing. It's always a good goal for, you know, just have your game playable. Yes, yes. So when you played it back in 2004, 2003, did you play all the way through for fun? Or what was the goal back then? Yeah, this is, you know, most of the time when you get done working on a game, you've just put so much of yourself into it and played it so many times, you never want to see it again. But uh, the Deus Ex was the, the, the first and, and so far only time, you know, I closed my eyes at the beginning of a project and imagined what it would be at the end and opened them up, you know, three years later and there it was. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually still fun to play. My gosh, the graphics are hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Whoa. outside of the faces, it holds up all right, though. Uh, you know, I mean, it was never about the graphics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wow, all those guys at IDOS who told me the game really wasn't very pretty were right. <laughs> Years later. Well, you had your eyes closed the whole time during development. Yeah. Others may not go as quietly as you think. So what was, it, what was going on at Ion Storm that kind of let that happen to, to, to let that vision really come through with ASX? It was amazing. You know, I, I was, um, I'd left Origin in, um, when was that, 1996. To, uh, to set up an independent development studio. I wanted to you know, make my own mistakes, right? And I didn't need any help from anybody else because I make plenty of my own. <laughs> um, and I was like this close to signing a deal with, uh, with EA actually to do the Command and Conquer role-playing game. I'm not sure I ever oh, actually man. talked about that. I had a contract on my desk, pen poised. <laughs> it's literally true, this is not an exaggeration. The phone rang as I was about to sign the contract and it was John Romero, and he said, uh, I want you to come work at Ion Storm. You know, wow. be a partner. Make, make the game of your dreams. I said, John, it's too late. Uh, I, I'm about to sign a contract. I got a deal. He said, no, no, no. I'm driving down. I'm going to change your mind. And he drove down the next day in his Hummer, <laughs> you know, from Dallas. And he changed my mind. I mean, he said, make the game of your dreams. No creative interference. No one will ever tell you anything. We'll give you three times the marketing budget you've ever had in your life. Do it. I was like, I mean, who says no to that, right? <laughs> so yeah. I did it. And, and, you know, to his credit, uh, he and IDOS lived up to that. I mean, certainly there was a lot of pressure to just make a shooter. I can't even tell you how many times people said, just make a shooter, just make a shooter, just make a shooter. Uh, but they never stopped me. Uh, so I got to make exactly the game I wanted to make, which was pretty incredible. Look at that. Look at that New York. Look at those crates. <laughs> uh, oh, man, I forgot how much head bob is in this game. Ooh. Yes, yes, we're all going to get car sick. Uh, but, but you know the, the freaky thing? Did you notice in the, uh, the skyline on the city of New York, there's no Twin Towers? Huh, really? Yeah, uh, it's a little freaky. Kind of uh, Parisian, really. Yeah, entirely coincidental, but this we're game about terrorism, and uh, uh, the Twin Towers are not part of the New York City skyline, although every other building on there, with a few exceptions that we added, uh, to show that it was the future. Um, everything else is a real building, uh, but we got rid of the Twin Towers. And I wish I could say we did it on purpose and we were you know, sort of seeing the future, but uh, it was actually just a mistake. The, guy, the artist who did the, the skybox just uh, left them out, and it sort of worked out in an unfortunate sort of way. So when you were designing the character J.C. Denton, who's on the right in this scene, he's the protagonist, I mean, he kind of ends up being mostly a cipher for the player. Uh, was that intentional? Absolutely, yeah. The, you know, the, one of the things that really gets in the way of immersing a player in the experience is 
forcing an emotion on them. We never wanted players to say, I'm not angry. Why is the character angry? Because uh, the whole point of Deus Ex was, it's not about how clever and creative we are as developers. It's about how clever and creative you are. It's who do you want J.C. Denton to be? How do you think the world should be? What do you think is the right solution? So we, we wanted J.C. to be a cipher. And, oh my God, poor Jay Frankie, the guy who did the voice. The actor did the voice for J.C. Denton. It's the only time in my life I've ever had to tell an actor, no, 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 too much emotion. Too much emotion. Take it down. Take it Be low affect. Just don't don't betray any emotion because we didn't want players to feel like they had to be happy or had to be set. I'm gonna stop doing this now. <laughs> so you said this was like the the game of your dreams, so to speak. Was yeah. this like an idea that you were kind of like working on in your head for years and years, or is it kind of yeah. just when they gave you the offer, you're like, oh, I'm gonna. This is something I've just come up with right no, now. No, 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 no. This uh, I I could show you the uh, the first design. Uh, well, the concept document. Oh my God, so many crates. So, <laughs> so um, much fun. Yeah. I don't remember any of the controls but, here. But uh, the, uh, oh, and look at that guy's head through oh, the man. geometry. Um, <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. I, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> well, so, hey, did you, which, which way? You took the crossbow, right? I did. Yeah, awesome. Okay, we're going yeah. for, for stealthy oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, 1995, I came up with a, a concept. Uh, I called it the real world role playing game, and I had a working title, uh, Troubleshooter. <laughs> uh, it was going to be okay. So, actually, sit, sit tight for one sec. Oh, well, sure. no, yeah, yeah, sit, yeah, sit tight for one sec. So, <laughs> um, I, I knew I wanted to make a game that where you could apply real world logic and solve problems the way you wanted to. Uh, and it was largely actually a response to, uh, to the, the thief team just like saying, No, we're not going to let you fight. You have to sneak. Uh, and I wanted to make a game that was set in the real world where you could apply real world logic and you could fight or sneak or talk your way past any problem. So, it started in about 95 and the game came out in 2000. So, uh, oh, man, you know, worked on it with a couple of people, it. a couple of publishers. Um, but yeah, I mean, like right here, you get up, you get up uh, off the docks, and immediately you're in a place where you you've got choices to make. And this was this was a magic moment for me. I'm not right this spot, but like around the corner, there's a place where you can hide, and you can see the situation basically. Okay. Um, oh my gosh. He's sneaking. He's sneaking. <laughs> oh, he's totally gonna get it. Keep it down. He here. is. Oh, yeah. man. Hey, it's a silent takedown. It you, is. You That's know? what I'm saying. This thing it's a rules. silent takedown. You're using the, the cattle oh. prod. Oh. No. There we go. All right. Hey, you better move the body or yeah, it might get seen. Right. Oh, if I can remember the key to do so. Uh-oh. E? No, that's lean. R? No. You're just right, just get out of there, man. Now. Just get out of there. Yeah, <laughs> run away. Run away. Run away. Right. Jason, our producer, says it's the right mouse button. Right mouse button is interact. Really? Oh, yeah. I suppose this is kind of before the age of secondary fire, right? This is before the age of everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, 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 I really was in, I, I was in Australia playing all these games, and I could not remember how to play my own games. It was Ugh. horrifying. Even but after playing it through so many times over and over? Even after playing through those so many times. The, the big difference between me and Richard Garriott is Richard Garriott remembers absolutely everything about absolutely every game he ever worked on, and I remember nothing. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of incredible. But um, I have no idea how to reload. We're just going to go weapon by weapon. <laughs> okay. This it's could be, be a great. very short demo. Uh, but no, there's a, there's a point... Where the heck did you go? Okay. I'll go around this side. No, the, the like the crates and stuff that you can climb up are over on the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. other so side. So you just there. zip right past the, the really interesting point. <laughs> um, no, there's a spot right when you get off the dock. Oh, and like oh, gosh, way so back, way back there. Don't go back. Okay. All right, but there's all a right. point where where you, you can we put some crates there specifically so you could stop and hide, which of course you did not do. Um, and I saw hardcore gamers. Just I, I called it paralyzed by choice. I saw them stop there and go, okay, over there I can see the entrance to the Statue of Liberty. It's brightly lit. There's a big robot there. Bunch of guys on short patrols with guns. And on the other side, you could look the other way and you'd see pools of shadow and lots of places to hide and two guys on really long patrols. And I thought that was as clear an indication of go over there, you're going to get into a fight. Go over there, you're going to sneak as you could possibly come up with. But what happened was... People just went, they, they literally took their hands off the controls and said, what do I do? I have a choice? It's like games had trained people oh, so effectively oh, man. Uh, to, not to think. Not to think. How the heck did that happen? I mean, I these days, know. games I, I, are such like, are, are all about like roller coaster experience at this yeah. point. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. Well, you know, actually, it's interesting you should say that because um, even even on the, the, the Mickey team, I have to tell the designers. Oh, they, that, see me? they saw me. They all saw right. you. They're okay. I, I have to tell people all the time that, you know, the, the pacing of our games is different. The pacing of this game was by design 
not like a standard shooter. Uh, every game I've worked on, the goal is headshot, headshot, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> um, As Adam attempts to get headshots. <laughs> And fail. Boy, it's hard to even watch and talk. I'm so intrigued by what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Good shooting tech. I want the I want um, the uh, I want the baton is what I want. That'd make my life a lot easier. You'll you'll get it. Um, <laughs> no, but but the the way the, all the games I've worked on, I mean, from the very start, their their pacing is uh, get to a, a place where you can see the situation, scope it out, make a plan. Go 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 go. Mm -hmm. Get to another place where you can see a situation, figure out how you want to deal with it, make a plan. Execute. Go, 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 go. Oh. So it's this really kind of herky jerky sort of sort of flow. Yeah. Which is exact I mean it like people can say they like it or they don't like it, but it's by design. I mean that's the way that's the way Mickey plays, that's the way this this plays, that's the way uh, uh, you know, I, all the games I work on play because I want to give players time to think about it. Like I don't want them just getting in a flow and not thinking. Oh, that bot is gonna be crazy when you say it out loud. <laughs> So right before we started, you were saying that you thought we would get like ten minutes in, and you just have you would have stories about like every oh, yeah. aspect of. I mean, do you, I know it's kind of a broad question, but do you have any kind of like weird stories or anything about developing Deus Ex? I mean, did you know that it was going to be kind of as influential as it has become? You know, I I hoped because uh, the my my real secret goal was to shame the rest of the industry. I'm I'm a shame driven person. <laughs> Make of that what you will. And I was just I was just so sort of sad at the state of games you know that that games were all about puzzle solving and killing stuff and not about anything important i guess you know and not really empowering players to decide how they wanted to be and uh so i i just Oops. wanted to make a game where you know like developers couldn't make the games they were making any more and feel good about it. Uh, so I hoped it would be influential, but I, you know, you never know. I remember towards the end of development, uh, and it was a very tough, tough development. I mean, it was really hard. How long was it? Uh, well, we started in... Uh, I know you just said the years, actually. It was about three, 36 months, about three okay. years. Um, oh, but uh, it was a kind of a fractious team. I mean, it was really like, you know, the designers hated the programmers, and the programmers hated the artists, and <laughs> half the design team hated the other half of the design team. I mean, it was really, it was an interesting uh, experience and dysfunction leading to something really pretty good. So I guess. you're at the, the principal of a high school, like trying to build a game. Or <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I sort of arrogantly thought I could manage the tension, and out of, out of tension would come greatness. Um, look at you figuring out how to get past this. I mean, like that. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff oh, that was uh, not uh, planned. Uh, <laughs> failing. Look at you this. almost figuring out. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, the, the 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 thing was, you know, towards the end of development, I I remember there was this moment where I just I, I put my head down on my desk, you know, and I just said, man, if if people get that they can they can play it like a shooter or they can play it like a stealth game. Or they can play it like a standard role-playing game. If people get that, we're going to rule the world. And if they don't, if they say, oh, well, their stealth model isn't as good as Thief, and their combat model isn't as good as Half-Life, and their role-playing systems aren't as robust as, you know, Neverwinter Nights. If people compared us to the, the sort of scalpel games out there, is the way I used to think about them, we were dead. <laughs> we were just dead. <laughs> but if they got that we were giving them a Swiss Army knife, and they were out in the wild, and they needed every, they needed the little tiny saw that was better than nothing. If they got that they were in charge and they could do anything they wanted, then we were going to win. And and as it turned out, we did okay. So you want to talk about when the reviews started coming in? Did you appreciate the reaction? Were you confused by some of the questions out there? Um, well, I, you're probably the wrong people to say this to, but I actually don't read reviews. Really? Uh, well, I don't read reviews. Ours, obviously. I, well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can't read reviews and I, I can't read interviews. Like, I've never read an interview with me, myself, and I. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, it's just it's just freaky, you know. So, uh, luckily, there are plenty of people around me who read them and sort of give me the gist of it. Uh, but I can't honestly say I know what the critical response was. I mean, I know, like, the Metacritic score. Cause sure. Trying to avoid the Metacritic score in this day and age is ridiculous. You can't do it. <laughs> So what's your what's your uh, philosophy behind not reading reviews? Um, it, it's total neurosis. Correct. I mean, it's it, it, if I if I were a rational human being, I would know that you know they can only make you better. Uh, but the problem is, I I just I don't know. I mean, I don't want my ego stoked. God knows it's big enough <laughs> uh, by good stuff, and I don't want my ego crushed because it's fragile enough by bad stuff. Uh, so I just try to. I just, boy, the word I is coming up a lot in this conversation. <laughs> uh, but I just try to oh, make gosh. the games I want to make. Yeesh. 
You're not the first person to do that. <laughs> um, you know, that would have been yeah. focus grouped out of existence if, yeah. if this game was made today. Yeah, if this you would have, they would have, somebody would have made you bring these shipping containers all the way against the wall so that nobody could fall down. Well, here's the other place where I'm going to get fired by Disney. Uh, I, <laughs> I could care less about focus test. I've never, ever Gosh. made a chance. That's not true. There were, oh, there were a bunch me. of things in, in Deus Ex 2 that we did because of, of market research, and I think that says it all. Hmm. Uh, so what kind of reaction did you have for a play test for this game? I have no idea. I mean, if they ever tested it, I ignored it. Okay. I, I literally have no idea. I mean, what I, what I am a big believer in is is getting people in to play the game and watching them play mm -hmm. and tuning based on the experience you want people to have. I mean, if, if you watch 100 people play your game and none of them notice that foozle over there, and you want them to notice the foozle, you better make the foozle more, you know, more apparent. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, th that is, uh, I call it blind test. I mean, that's not Your me, point. but blind testing, I think, is hugely useful. But uh, sort of formal focus testing where you bring in, up, you know, GC. 10 kids from 12 to 17 and the let them play the game the and the interview them and all that. Ah, who cares? <laughs> I mean, I guess it's, I can, I understand the idea of like sort of seeing how they respond to the sort of uh, puzzles you've given them in place, but, I get, but you just don't really, you're not concerned about what they have to say about improving their personal experience, I guess, right? Um, well, I, I, observation is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you, what, what people say is not particularly relevant. Oh. Um, what they the do game. is hugely relevant. Yeah. So watching people play, not helping them Never is know. painful. Yeah. But when you see where people are having trouble or where things are too easy, that's that's important data, and you need that. What's your take? But that's very different from a focus group where you ask people what they think afterwards, and there's all these interviews and all that stuff. You know, did you think it was too hard? Did you think it was too? You know, if someone's what, what usually happens is that people have a great time, and then they tell you it was too hard, or it was too easy, or it was just right. I mean, it, 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 this this is hmm. it's an art form. Damn it. <laughs> you know? It's a good quote. That's an art uh, form. Damn it. We have gotten ourselves a nice bug here where I'm not able to change my weapon and I don't have any pistol ammo. Okay. I absolutely refuse to take any responsibility for bugs <laughs> in a 12 year old game. Um, you, you, didn't, yeah, you, guys, uh, you didn't regression test this on uh, level 7? I have. You don't, have a, you don't have a patch plan for this? Or you guys are working on the side? Oh, uh, like oh, you guys are killing me now. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, look, there is something really interesting here. I mean, think about just in a decade how much more accessible and more polished games have become, right? I mean, this game was was kind of state of the art at the time. Oh, this is the uh, other best thing is I can lure these guys back into the bot. Oh, for sure. The bot will totally wreck them for, for me. sure. But again, again, that's not planned. That you know, that's right. that's what I call simulating just deeply enough that you know you can make a plan and do stuff that no one expected. I mean, there there was one example. Uh, a year after we shipped the game, uh, one of our testers was showing off the game to some execs from IDOS. And he was inside the Statue of Liberty, right on the main level, trying to solve a problem that I had seen a thousand times before. I'd played it a hundred times. I'd seen it a thousand times. And he tried something that uh, I never saw anybody try before. And I had no idea if it was going to work. I mean, like, I was one of the people who created this game. And I had no idea if this guy's plan was going to work. I mean, that's... And it did, it, which is kind of magical. I mean, it really kind of gets into that sandbox idea, right? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. sort of the goal... The, the whole well the, the interesting thing about about Deus Ex to me at the time was it's like there's sort of a continuum of of you know story game philosophy right at, at the at one extreme you've got total roller coaster rides where every player's doing everything exactly the same as any other player and the the sort of challenge is am I smart enough or skilled enough to solve the puzzle that the designer wanted me to solve and at the other extreme you've got you know, total sandbox this. games like The Sims and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and what I wanted with Deus Ex was I wanted it to be right down the middle. I wanted it to be a story game where I owned the big beats. You know, your brother is being held captive, save him. Or uh, there are terrorists in the Statue of Liberty, get them out. And then I wanted not to care how the player did it. Do you kill all the terrorists? Some people are going to think you're a hero. Some people are going to think you're a bore. You know, do you uh, leave them all alive and capture them alive? Some people are going to think you're an idiot and some people are going to think you're you're a, a god. You know, so how you solve the problem is up to you. It's a sandbox within a story. That was the, the, the thing that Deus Ex did. That, you know, even now, a lot of other games don't do. Uh, so that that was kind of the, the, the deal. Uh, it's funny, though, you said puzzle a minute ago. 
Puzzle is a word we are not allowed to use at Junction Camp. Uh, I berate anyone who says that. We create problems, not puzzles. We create challenges, not puzzles. And what's the difference in your mind? It, 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 it's kind of arbitrary, I guess, but I mean, jargon always is. Uh, a puzzle is a thing that has a single solution, you know, and that's not what games should be about. If a game is about, you know, reading the mind of a game designer, why bother? Uh, it seems like you're just, all you're doing is wasting the player's time. And sometimes time, time passing is an important thing. for. I mean, I, I like games that just pass some time. But games can be so much more. Uh, and Deus Ex was specifically designed to, you know, whether we succeeded or not, was designed to be more than that. Yeah. So problems, not puzzles. And that's can, true of Disney Epic Mickey. Yeah, I can vouch for that, where Warren tells the design team that if there's only one solution to a problem, then they have failed. And if he finds that in the game, they really get a talking to. So <laughs> to, to really emphasize the play style matters, each uh, problem that exists in the game has multiple ways of addressing it. Yeah, and where, where it's really magical is, you know, I, in Deus Ex, um, not quite as much as, as in some of the earlier games. I mean, like some of the, the early Ultima games I worked on, we literally planned out two puzzles to solve, to, to, to get past each challenge, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and in Deus Ex, we did some of that. But the magic happens when, you know, players figure out some other way, a third way or a fourth way that you just never even thought about. Oh, there's another bug. Thank you so much for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> this is such an incredible pleasure. It's, it's dark. There could be a conveyor belt there. You know, oh. we don't know. <laughs> oh, my God. So, Warren, I'm curious what your thoughts are on Dishonored, Harvey Smith's new game. Uh, damn, I can't wait to play it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I've been using the word I a lot here. It's really, really important to understand that, uh, you know, any game is a team effort. And Deus Ex, as functional as the team was, more than, more than most. I mean, uh, this game would not have been anything like it was without Harvey. I mean, who came, Harvey came along and, like, completely redesigned yeah. the, the uh, skill system at one point. Because we implemented my skill system, and it was horrible. <laughs> I mean, it was, just, it was no fun. Uh, we blind tested it. And I was able to see no fun, <laughs> right? Uh, Harvey redesigned that. Harvey and uh, uh, designer Steve Powers, who's also working on Dishonored now, um, they, uh, they came to me one day and said, wow, this story that you came up with, there's no way we can tell that story. How about we simplify it? Here, we got some ideas. We went out to lunch. We went to a restaurant called Zite House in Austin. I remember it as if it were yesterday. And they walked me through some story revisions, completely brought the game to life. So that all came out of design. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about the, uh, the, the sort of intelligence of, of the story and a lot of the quotes and, you know, philosophical things in, in the game. Uh, so much of that came from Sheldon Picotti, the lead writer. Um, and, and then, and I mean, Chris Norton, the, uh, the, the, I, he, he, I basically made him the assistant director. That's what he's credited as. And he totally deserved that. Uh, he was the lead programmer on the project. And that guy, I mean, without him, we might never have shipped. And uh -huh. we certainly wouldn't have shipped the game we did. So, I mean, this, this is such a team effort. It's amazing. I mean, my, I, I, frankly, I think the most important things I did on Deus Ex were come up with the original idea, you know, jealously guard the idea that play style matters, uh, and then prevent uh, Harvey Sheldon, Chris, and uh, Jay Lee, the art director, from killing each other. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you think the tension was a result of it just being a new studio, or was it the ambitiousness of the game? Or? It, it was, it, I think it was a little of both, but I think it was mostly, I would call it the ambitiousness of the game. I think it was that at this point, no one had ever really made a game that was trying to be uh, as much of a shooter as it was a stealth game, as a role-playing game. I mean, when, what, I, what I did was I built a team um, that was made up of some hardcore origin style role players and some hardcore looking glass style immersive simulation guys some hardcore shooter guys and and that was the tension i thought i could manage and i guess you know i guess i did okay but like i, I said it was that. really the team sort of coming together and and, worry about it. and resolving that tension <laughs> for themselves so how you play it determined what the game felt like mm -hmm. which is exactly what we're trying to do in, in disney epic mickey now like if except we're instead of combining stealth uh, shooter and role playing. We're combining um, action adventure like Zelda, so platforming like Mario, and uh, you know, sort of role play, light role playing element. You know, so it's it's just I just think it's really interesting merging genres like that, mashing things together that don't belong together, and seeing what happens. Sure, that was the tension, really. I think.
Sorry, I uh, just wanted to interject that I went and jumped in front of that guy and suicided because I'm still bugged and literally can do nothing. Uh, which is... <laughs> This is so depressing. You have <laughs> no idea. But yeah, like I, uh, I can't actually change weapons or use. Does this anything. mean like everybody's gonna take this off their best games of all time? <laughs> <listening>? <laughs> that was a, that was actually the the plan uh, <laughs> in bringing you so down here. Just gotta boot up Windows ninety five to play it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you know the amazing thing is that it's running at all. Uh, I, I was I was talking to uh, my buddy Doug Church uh, from Looking Glass uh, now at Valve, and. Uh, we were we were oh, whining gosh. at each other that we we were both trying to get System Shock running, couldn't do it, <laughs> just couldn't even get it running. Hey, welcome back. We had some technical difficulties, but uh, we're back, and I can switch weapons and reload and shoot and everything now. So it'll should be more interesting, hopefully. <laughs> so we're gonna just come back. You took to our the Gep gun this time too. I did. Oh, oh gosh, <laughs> that'll be a slightly different experience. It will. Yeah, the bot go? There just kind of on that topic of like, you know, we were having a couple issues playing it on a, on, a, on Windows 7. Has uh, and and remakes are really popular these days. Has has that ever come up like a remake or an HD like re-release for Deus Ex or anything like that? Or are you too much too busy with that? Well, well, the, the, well, with the thing like is, look, I, I work for Disney now, so it's not like I can make a, a remake of Deus Ex. But uh, I've certainly talked to to plenty of folks about. Uh, you know, it would be really cool to update the graphics and the sound and the uh, the, the user interface and controls and everything. I mean, be, I, I'd love to see that happen. But, you know, the, the, the cool thing, not cool thing, the silly thing is <laughs> someone should do that with Underworld. Um, That'd be kind of awesome. It, it's it, it's kind of amazing. I, I got a chance to get hands-on with that for the first time in probably 20 years um, recently. And, I mean, look, the graphics are, I mean, I, we thought we were changing the world and, you know, they, this was like the most amazing thing ever, but um, modern graphics and a modern control interface and uh, and modern sound that would still be like the state of the art in role playing, which is kind of a sad commentary in a lot of ways. <laughs> but but I would love to see that happen. Please, somebody make you know a, a modern day remix of Deus Ex and Underworld. Those are the two games that I would love to just play again personally. I'm curious what you thought of the PS2 port of this game. Well, it was made in my office, and I was right there. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, it, the interesting thing is, uh, I'm, I'm really pretty proud of it. Um, we uh, we got the we were using the Unreal Engine, of course, and we we got the PS2 version of the Unreal Engine before it, it wasn't actually a fully functional thing. It was still a work in progress at Epic, and we made so many, so many enhancements to the engine that the PS2 actually ran at a reasonable frame rate, which was astonishing. And I begged IDOS, I begged them, please let me do a new release of Deus Ex on the PC because if we had brought all of those uh, performance enhancements into the PC version, oh. we would have been running at a solid 30 frames, maybe maybe 60 frames a second. Um, whereas we were really psyched when we hit 12 <laughs> you know, on, on the PC. So it, it's really unfortunate. They never wanted to go back and do another another build, but if, if we had, man, we could have made the PC just fly. <laughs> That's interesting. Have you ever looked at any of some of the community stuff that has come out? Because uh, there's a ton of mods and you know texture packs and gameplay mods and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I, I have. Uh, you know, not recently, but I, back in the day, I, I certainly looked at a lot of them, and and some of them were were pretty ambitious. Uh, a couple of them, I, I wish I could remember the names. I feel really bad now, but some of them, some of them were pretty good. But what what I really took away from it is, wow, we did something really hard. You know, there was a point where we did, uh, we released our tools in the Game of the Year edition. We did a, uh, a, a build a, a Deus Ex mission contest. And we, well, we, we didn't get a single thing back that was publishable. Really? Know? Yeah, well, because people get shooters and people get stealth games. But making a game that gives people choice, it's like even, even when you hire the most experienced designer uh, at Junction Point to work on a Disney Epic Mickey game, it's like it's a different you're using different muscles you know hmm. getting yourself off the stage so players can get on it letting players express themselves is something that's not sort of bred in it's not built in for uh, for most for most designers it's about them building a level that beats players or that challenges them look at this cool puzzle i built that's that's the first thing people go to and so uh, most of the people who did mods built pretty straightforward stuff it's hard to be I mean, there aren't a lot of people who can create, you know, maps that allow multiple points of access, who can handle a simulation that lets players 
figure out the, the way to get past a problem that provide fun and challenging combat scenarios and fun and challenging stealth scenarios and have great dialogue. I mean, that skill set doesn't exist, really. Great dialogue. From, from what gaming is uh, telling me, just from what's out there, great dialogue is pretty much impossible in video games. So, Well, it, it shouldn't be. I mean, the problem is we just haven't, uh, as, as a medium, I don't want to say as a business, but as a medium, we just haven't put the effort into it, you know? I, it's like I, I was saying this earlier uh, to someone else. Uh, can you imagine what the world of gaming would be like if John Carmack and Tim Sweeney spent as much time on non-combat AI as they do on rendering? Can you imagine where games would be if they were more worried about human behavior than pretty pictures? <laughs> uh, can you imagine where we would be if, if one of those guys said, I'm going to recreate, well, frankly, what we're doing right here, right now. Having a conversation is impossible in a game. Mm -hmm. If someone came up with a way to make that as interesting and as exciting as it is in the real world, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, I can't even <laughs> imagine what games would happen. Oh gosh. Yeah, you're oh, dead. Oh, you're dead. Oh gosh. Good so, luck. did you uh, predict uh, how many people would mispronounce the game? <laughs> when I worked I in retail, did. I got Deusex all the time. Like, every, like I had to convince oh, my coworkers on. that it was Deus Ex. The most important so lesson dead. I learned. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just dying. Don't worry. <laughs> go on. It's fine. I never worry. Um, no, the oh, most man. important lesson I learned on Deus Ex is don't think you're being cute and funny by uh, calling your name your game Deus Ex, and if people mispronounce it, they're just going to say do sex. <laughs> 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 what, what you discover is, A, the American educational system really doesn't prepare people to pronounce Deus Ex. People don't know what a Deus Ex Machina is. They don't understand that I was making fun of how bad most game stories are. Uh, is that the origin of the name? Absolutely. It's just making fun of well, how... It, 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 was, awesome. it, was, it worked on two levels. It worked, well, three levels. It worked on the level of oh, I'm making fun of bad game... Uh, stories. It worked on the level of if they um, if they mispronounce it, they're going to say sex. <laughs> uh, and it, it it worked on the level of you know Deus Ex Machina, you know God from the Machine, and it's the game is fundamentally not spoiler alert. It, it's about you know the the role of ascension AI in you know in relation to humanity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you know God from the Machine, you know kind of works the Helios storyline, all that. I'd so love to just, see the uh, the PowerPoint presentation of like we're calling it Deus Ex for oh, these what? reasons, and then number two oh, is gosh. like make players say do see? sex. <laughs> you forgot about the turret. Is there a thing like right there's above a, me? There's a turret. Awesome. I remember that. <laughs> How do I remember that? Um, I thought. Yeah, I had you this really time, want though. you really wanted to disarm that. Uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna try that next time. Yeah, make you sure know. you die less, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is probably this is yeah. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah. This game's hard. I just I also want to just bring up that none of us wanted to play the game. We had to go upstairs and get Adam because none of us are good at PC hey, games. I would have played the game except I can't talk and drive at the same time. Oh, there we go. I, there you I don't go. think I have a multi tool though. You do not. Oh man. You can use the crowbar. Yeah, can I just crowbar the camera? Should be able to. All right. Awesome. Or you could shoot it if you want to make noise. Oh, that sounds like a terrible idea, though. Oh, gosh. Oh. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> all right, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Never trust a developer. We're all liars. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but, oh, my gosh. I was just, just in here. This is so funny because Har Harvey is about to kill me, I think. <laughs> um, I'm no, like, we're I, already laughing. I made, I made Harvey build this. I got, I got blueprints. And it's like, this, was, this is the game where I said, Show me the blueprints. Oh, Build gosh. the blueprints. Oh, um, and and I gave him blueprints of the Statue of Liberty and made him... Oh, that's a dead guy. That's <laughs> not a good idea, though. There we go. Of the Statue oh, of did, Liberty? He hadn't yeah. actually seen me. Oh, goodness. Yeah, and, and he was... I mean, like, everybody was thought I was nuts. And maybe I was. I don't know. But, like, we had to convince people they were in a, in a, a world they cared about, the, the real world, and, and get them to, to think... Sort of logically, like apply oh, some real man. world logic to the situation you're in. Unlike Adam, who is playing like a <laughs> madman. Well, see, I can't reload is the problem because I don't know what the button is. How about trying the R button? No, R leans. R leans? We R were leans. so smart. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, so it's good. It's go a, to it's settings. A, go to settings to check the, catch, check the control. So earlier oh, okay. you said uh, nice shooting text to yeah. Adam. <laughs> Clearly a Ghostbusters <laughs> reference. <laughs> Was there ever any kind of Ghostbusters 2 controlling the Statue of Liberty, maybe like a, a kind of thing? No, I wish. I <laughs> wish. Where, were, where were you 15 years ago? 
Semicolon. Of course. I actually mapped well, you just, re- you, just, you just remapped it. I know. Okay. <laughs> Boy, games have come a long way. (laughs) I'm telling you, we thought it was a good thing that we were using Uh. every key on the keyboard. That's PC gaming, man. Uh. We only have 15 buttons on this stupid PlayStation (laughs) controller. How can you play a real game on it? Man, it's crazy going back to this, too. Like, There's no focus group in existence that would let you take actually five seconds to reload a pistol like you would in real life, like you do in Deus Ex, right? Like, That would never happen. That's why you need to ignore focus group. I agree. <laughs> no, I mean, look, the, the, the bottom line is, uh, I, I mean, even guys at IDOS, I remember so many, we had publishing meetings, which is where, you know, projects got evaluated and greenlit and killed and all that stuff. And it's like, I, it's so many times, uh, one of the, the IDOS execs would, would say, what percentage of players Oops. are going to sneak through this game? And I said, you know, I don't know, maybe 30%. You know, and they said, "Well, if seventy percent of your players are going to play it like a shooter, why are you spending any time and money on the stealth stuff?" And I said, "Because that's the game I want to make." <laughs> and you know, they they let me do it. I mean, that's the thing. I'm not sure that would happen now. Honestly, I am the nice. did you have conversations with them after the game came out and it was successful? Yes. Yeah, saying sure. I told well, you I so. No, I didn't have to because everybody took credit for it. Of course. Uh, no, I that's fine. <laughs> no, I, I, that's that's me being a twit. Um, no, IDOS was guys. hugely supportive. I mean, they really ah, were. It was, it was, it, they I were a great company to work with. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> God darn it. Well, hey, um, we've been at this for a while. Maybe, uh, <laughs> should we... Maybe we should... I mean, how long have we been going here? We could, uh, we, we could move on to our next game, our replay roulette. Absolutely. We've got lots of great stories from Warren, and uh, yeah, it's been awesome. I, I don't know. I feel like I need more chances to embarrass myself. I, I really haven't made the most of this one yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think you've been kind of a pro. <laughs> <laughs> See, how far can I jump? Oh, man. I yeah, why don't you die one more time, and then we'll move All on right. to the next segment. Right. I just got to avoid this guy long enough to jump. Oh, oh, oh. man. Sorry, we had arguments about, like, jumping on stuff, too. And I just said, you know, like, how can you be the most powerful, like, guy in the universe? <laughs> And not be able to jump on a table. Come on. I mean, how many games have you played where you can't, like, jump on a table? <laughs> cool. Should awesome. we move on? Yeah, let's, let's do it. Next, uh, Replay Roulette is up next. We'll still have Warren and uh, Rahul around. And Adam and Ben. Those guys are cool, I guess. <laughs> Man. Hey, everybody. We're back. Uh, Replay Roulette. We are looking at uh, I don't know, show. Oh, okay. Here's the title. Sweet it in. We got Adam Raul's back, and uh, Warren is back again, and Ben Hansen. And uh, Warren, you picked this game. You when you were showing me Epic Mickey earlier, we were we brought up Sweet and We were talking about Sweet and how it relates to Deus Ex and everything. So tell us why you love this game so much. It's incredible. There's this. Well, first of all, just listen to that music. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Love the music. Um, there are so many things in this game that that influenced me and other game developers. It's kind of crazy. Um, there's there are two things in particular early in the game. I don't know if we're going to have time to get to them here, but um, early in the game, there, there's this one little guy. He's a friend of yours in your party, and he's just annoying, almost beyond belief. It's, it's a little guy. He's your best friend. And he's constantly telling you he's your best friend. I'm your best friend. I'm your best friend. And he's getting in the way. You're in combat and stuff, and he's always in the way. And then and he he gets himself really badly hurt. So you end up back in an inn, and He's on his deathbed, basically, when your enemies come along and he drags himself out of his deathbed and stands between you and your enemies and says, you go, you have important things to do, I'll hold them off. And you, you have to decide, there's a little, a little choice box comes up and says, do you leave him here or do you defend him? And it's like, I went, holy cow. It's like, you have to put your controller down and say, am I going to do this? And uh, who am I? It has nothing to do with the game anymore. It's about you. And as it turns out, it's a completely false choice. You you don't have any choice. But I didn't realize that until much later in the game. <laughs> and and so that was the, that was, so like that choice was really a powerful moment for me. And then later, much later in the game, spoiler alert, that there's a point where you have to decide whether to fight your father. Your father has taken one side in a battle for control of this land, and you're on the other side. And you don't know who's, (laughs) oh my lord. Um, (laughs) You don't know which side is the right side. Do you fight your father? And a little choice box comes up and says, do you fight your father? Why and? (laughs) (laughs) Why not? 
<laughs> well, that would be your choice, but I was really blown away that a game was like asking you to make that kind of decision. It's like, that's a kind, I mean, it's not like, do you kill this thing with a meat hook or do you kill it with a rocket? <laughs> I mean, that's not a usual kind of choice. And so that was also a false choice. You have no choice. But I, I, I said, what if a game really gave you that choice and let you do it? Can you say Deus Ex, right? I mean, <laughs> that, was, that was a huge moment for me, playing this game, seeing just the power of that choice and knowing that if I really gave players that choice, well, you know, we might rule the world, right? And, and so that was, that was one thing. The other thing is, in this game, this is the first game I ever played that had the idea of, of a fortress. And so eventually in the game, you, you get to a point this is the longest conversation in the history of video games, by the way, which is probably the last thing we're going to get to in this demo. Um, God, I can't believe I remember all this stuff. Um, anyway, there's, you have a fortress, and it's just a big rock outcropping rubbly thing. But as you go out and you save, there are 108 characters that you can save. It is really freaking hard to save them all. And you can annoy some of them so they won't come. There are some characters who hate other characters. So if you have certain characters, other characters won't come and stay in your fortress. So you're constantly saying, who do I want in my fortress? So this was kind of like, this is sort of what developing Deus Ex was like for you. Because you said there was all this. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> deep. Wow. Hold on. I am now completely freaked out. <laughs> I got pretty meta there. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm excited. <laughs> um, what you really what about that one, man? N is silent. Yeah. Master um, Warren. But, but it, it, and the things, like, the characters, I'm just going to keep talking. I ignore all of you. I do this at the office a lot, too. Uh, the, the characters you save determine, like, how, who's at your fortress, how your fortress looks, because they kind of decorate it differently. They have different functions. Some of them can give you tactical information about major battles that you're about to go into. Uh, some of them sell you armor, some of them sell you arms, some of them give you healing. I mean, so who you have in your fortress completely changes how your game plays out, which armies you have at your disposal. And there are these enormous army versus army battles. And if you get all the magic users, you've got powerful magic at your disposal in these mass battles. But if you uh, if you don't collect all the, collect, if you don't save <laughs> all of the magic users and you get all the really badass, you know, army guys, your armies are stronger against conventional enemies. So you're constantly thinking, how do I want this game to feel? And, and that was hugely influential too. I mean, it's just, this is a magical, magical game that nobody remembers. It's crazy. And people, a lot of people remember like Sweet in 2 and Sweet in mm -hmm. 3 and all the later ones. First one is the best. I love this music. Oh my God. Um, no, this, this game opened my eyes to a whole lot of things that I'd sort of done instinctively. But all of a sudden, I understood why I wanted to do it on purpose, you know? And the interesting thing was uh, uh, earlier, um, well, last year, uh, I was looking for a developer to work on the 3DS version of Disney Epic Mickey and uh, met with uh, Peter Ong, the creative director for uh, Dream Rift, the company that's doing the 3DS game for us. And <laughs> hang on, Warren, <laughs> like could you it. please make this decision for me? Uh, <laughs> tickle him. <laughs> You seem like a tickler. I am. <laughs> um, see, if you go, I think if you go to, like, down to the left, you'll 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 meet this really obnoxious little guy who's like, oh, is this oh the best maybe friend? not. Oh, I thought this was the best friend. It, it may that may happen later. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's his room down there on the lower left. But he's not he's not like sick yet. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Peter he came in with a before I even told him what what. Disney Epic Mickey was about and what I was looking for. He came in with a proposal to do a 3DS game where you drew things on the bottom screen that then appeared on the top, changing your experience there. And I went, okay, that's pretty uh, Mickey-like. And and he, he started saying, okay, so I re what I really want to do is a game that has, uh, you know, you, re you save various characters and it's got a fortress in it. And I went, Suikoden. <laughs> and he said, You've heard of Suikoden? And it's like we spent the next like hour goobering about how great this game was. So, I mean, it, it maybe not the best way to decide who gets a job. But man, he, he had the job right there. Holy cow. Just for, from liking Suikoden so yeah, much? just from liking Suikoden. So I mean, if, if you're a game developer and you want Warren Spector's help with making some kind of game, just give him a call about Suikoden. Oh, man. Not, not the worst idea, man. <laughs> you can bribe a boar? <laughs> I, oh, I kind of forgotten that Portuguese bribe a boar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Warren, is this your favorite RPG of all time? 
Wow. Um, no. Oh, no. what is it? Um, I'd probably say Ultima Four. Okay, I, uh, that's a, a pretty common choice for that. I mean, for for, for people my of age, age. Is that yeah. what you're gonna say? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a lot where I was game. going with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> you, young, you young whippersnappers, get off my lawn! That board just ran right through you, didn't he? He did. <laughs> Yeah, all me to die. Die. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> we are terrible at replay today. Really? <laughs> I guess we're so used to auto saving every single oh, thing yeah, or exactly. checkpoints in all of our modern hey. games. We just forgot to go in and save. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man. It's a, that's not a bad look at Swicked uh, in. Uh, I feel fulfilled. Uh, yeah. Me too. I, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that it's your failure this time. And no, Warren <laughs> is at the controls. Warren hey, is at the controls. No, 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 no. <laughs> He's lying. Tapping Mike you. with right hand, tapping Mike with left hand. No, no, no. No controller here. Awesome. Sorry, sound guy. Awesome. Well, hey, this has been great. Thank you so much for playing Deus Ex with us and, uh, excuse me, uh, Deus Ex with us and Swick it in. <laughs> this has been awesome. It was cool to hear uh, all those stories and, um, yeah, maybe we'll see a director's cut where you can control the Statue of Liberty pretty soon, right? That'd Remake? Be pretty cool. Let's do it. All right, thanks, here first. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Raul. Thank you, guys. That'd be a fun feature don't at some point. Okay. Sure. I think it, we're back in business. Should I explain, or should we just start back up? Oh, you, you explain it, right? Yeah, let me plow through Paul again, since we've already done that. Because um, it's, it's just a bunch of dialogue, and it's boring. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Not like that. No, it's just it's boring because hey, we've done it like Shel four times Shel in the last... Shelton's a terrific writer, damn it. <laughs> Actually, uh, I mean, I don't need to fanboy out at you, but uh, I mean, Deus Ex is probably top three all time for me. So. What are the top two? No, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs>